There is a charming spot in the Finger Lakes country of central New York that we know as Sapsucker Woods. Friends have given it to Cornell University to be set aside in perpetuity as a bird sanctuary. At its northern border is a woodsy pond where the waterfowl vie with the frogs and toads to make the nights musical and interesting. We call it Sapsucker Woods because here the yellow-bellied sapsucker finds a place sufficiently cool to satisfy its Canadian urge and sound its irregular Morse code and rear its young south of its normal range. Here also the northern water thrush teeters and scolds and sends its ringing notes through the flooded woods. Sweet, 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 where, 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 he calls. Canada warblers likewise stay here, calling Wichita Wichit. And a single hermit thrush is content to spend the summer and charm us with his evening song. At the edge of the Ten Acre Pond, an unusual ranch-type building with broad picture windows overlooks a scene of quiet beauty, especially as the sun drops below the horizon and the soft sunset colors are reflected in its mirrored surface. It is Cornell's Laboratory of Ornithology. Microphones beneath the wide eaves catch all the sounds of nature as the creatures of the day give way to those of the night. We now invite you to sit with us at the west window as the shadows lengthen and listen to the changing calls of the wild. Let's make it June when the summer birds are singing, though it would be just as interesting in the spring with the migrants or in the fall with the insects and the waterfowl. The scarlet tanager is the first to greet us from a nearby pine, singing like a robin in a hurry with a cold. Hurry, worry, flurry, blurry. Now the descending spirals of the Viri. Followed by the liquid phrases of the wood thrush. Across the road, over the open field, a bobolink sings his last song of the evening. And then gives over to the Vesper Sparrow that does his finest singing in the twilight. The Vesper Sparrow will stop singing as it grows darker, but the vivacious Henslow Sparrow 
continues its insect-like call on through the night. Turning back to the pond, the red wings are still sounding their rondelays. and the tree swallows are twittering about the birdhouses. A red-shouldered hawk calls Kiyu as it makes one last circle before seeking out some high roosting place. And a female wood duck cries as it hurtles through the trees. A pileated woodpecker calls loudly before going to roost. The low questioning quacks of a male mallard are followed by the resounding decrescendo of his mate. A kingfisher rattles as he makes off with his evening meal. and a green heron sounds his raucous call. Now we hear the low liquid notes of the American bittern, preceded by a tapping sound made by clapping its bill. We are scarcely prepared for the next demonstration when the startling call of the pied-billed grebe reverberates across the pond. It is hard to believe that such a small, duck-like bird can make such a terrific noise. The lilting call of a spotted sandpiper is a pleasant contrast as he flies to a large boulder and starts teetering on his slender legs. while his companion of the shoreline, the killdeer, calls his name as he circles overhead. Ducks are now swimming toward us, marking the smooth surface of the pond with widening V's. It is too dark to see any colors, but soon we can hear them diving, and the car call of a male redhead tells us what they are. Muskrats now become active, but they make no sound. They merely see small blunt heads followed by long tails cutting the water, their fat little bodies entirely submerged. A nighthawk now calls from overhead with his sharp burry note. A little tree toad, the peeper, starts his all-night serenade.
The more melodious trills of the common toads start out from the shallows. And now, since the evening is warm enough, a common tree toad gives his much louder trill. Green Frog Chorus is now starting. And a lone bullfrog adds his bass voice to the concert. Suddenly all is quiet, and then out of the darkness of the wood comes the eerie call of a barred owl. In the distance, a horned owl gives his less varied hoots. A mellow little screech owl calls close by. And we realize it is really dark and the voices of the evening have given way to those of the night. And now, before all these voices become confused with those of tomorrow, let's move to the fireside, and from a comfortable chair, listen to them again, and perhaps see how many we can recognize without help from announcements.